Good morning, School-Based Health Alliance <laughs> congregants. I'm still getting used to that too. I'm John Schlitt. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs for the National Assembly on School-Based Healthcare. Tomorrow will be the School-Based Health Alliance. And we want to welcome you back for our final session this morning. But before we do, I, um, I just want to thank a, 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 an important group of people that have been so critical to the high quality event that you've experienced these last several days. And that is to the, the Convention Planning Committee uh, who did a tremendous work. So I'd all like to ask you to thank them for the, putting the fantastic program together. Um, I imagine most of you were tired last night because I don't think you ever left the dance floor. And then some of you went to the library last night. Did you check out a lot of books? Interesting. I'm sorry I missed that. The, the last bit of thanks I want to offer is to an extraordinary group of people from New Mexico who threw out the welcome mat to us and gave us the most extraordinary hospitality at our time here. So to our New Mexico hosts, thank you very much. I'm only sorry that it took us 17 years to get here. <laughs> But we'll be back, I assure you. Uh, before we turn our attention to a very important topic, health care reform, um, I just very briefly want to acknowledge that on your tables is a piece of paper called Called for Proposals, Healthcare Policy Innovations and Art Innovations Exchange. Our partners at Academy Health um, are conducting a search for best practices around policy innovation that is changing the way we deliver health care, the way we get better health care outcomes at a lower cost, the AAA, as many of you know. And I'd like us to make sure that school-based health centers get recognized in this um, database of model programs that state policy leaders and national policy leaders will be looking to to see how they can be inspired to create change in their states and communities. So I urge you to take this back with you and contact Academy Health if you've got a policy innovation that you think is uh, worthy of being put into that database. So. Um, last bit of housekeeping. We've got a phenomenal group of national, state, and local leaders to talk about health care reform and the potential effect on school-based health centers. When that session closes, we have about a 10-minute wrap-up. There's an iPad here that's just waiting to be gobbled up by the lucky winner of the drawing. So if that's not motivation enough to keep you in your seats, I hope you'll stay. So without a f further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, a leader in school-based health care, a member of the National Assembly Board of Directors, Maureen Hanrahan, who's going to moderate our session this morning. Maureen, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, we're going to spend the next um, hour and 15 minutes really diving into the issue of, you know, the impact on health care reform. Um, as we were planning this, we knew this week was going to be a critical week. Um, I don't know whether we hoped Monday there would have been an answer or not, um, but as it turns out, we are still in ambivalence. Um, but as I think about it, those of us who've been in, um, in school-based health care, we've dealt with a lot of flexibility and ambiguity over the years. So um, hopefully we will be able to um, respond and, and think about, in, without the concreteness of uh, the Supreme Court decision, um, and integrate that maybe tomorrow morning or whatever. So um, we're going to do a few things um, during this period of time. So let me just tell you um, kind of the format and then, um, then so that you can be thinking about your questions. We, um, I'm going to introduce our, um, our uh, panel members. And as John said, they are really, it's a wonderful blend, not only of national, um, state, and kind of community perspective, but also public health and policy and Medicaid public program perspectives. So um, I'm, I think we're going to uh, push them hard on all those areas as much as we can. So I'm going to, um, after introducing them, I'm going to um, ask some questions that we've developed and the NASPIC staff have helped us develop. Um, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to ask questions from the audience. And we're going to close with um, 
a question about you know, their advice to us um, if it doesn't come out in the conversation. So this is really meant to be a conversation and thus set up this way and, and hopefully we will be able to interact and, um, and also ask some questions as we go along. So let's go on and I'm going to introduce to my immediate right is Mary Takeash, who is the program director at the National Academy for State Health Policy and she's based in Maine. She focuses on issues related to primary care and specifically the patient-centered medical home, federally qualified health centers, and delivery system reform. So a lot of what we've been talking about over these several days. Her current projects include helping states advance medical homes, building partnerships with Medicaid directors and safety net providers, and analyzing state policy implications for the evaluation of the multi-payer advanced primary care practice demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> She's also worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative assistant for two congressmen and in a wide variety of clinical settings as a registered nurse. She holds a master's in public health degree from Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and a bachelor of science in nursing uh, with honors from Northeastern University. So we're glad you're here, Mary. Thank you. Next uh, to Mary is Mark Pitcock who was named Deputy Director of the New Mexico Medical Assistance Division last year after joining the agency in a systems management role in 2007. Among his duties as Deputy Director is oversight of the Medicaid School Health Office. Mark has worked in the Medicaid arena for 29 years, serving in a variety of public and private sector roles. Welcome, Mark. And last but not least is Dr. Bachara Chukar, who is the Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Dr. Chukar recently unveiled Healthy Chicago, the first citywide comprehensive public health agenda. Healthy Chicago is a call to action for all Chicagoans to work together on a common vision of making Chicago the healthiest city in the nation. Um, and that's a uh, <laughs> Big task, yes. being a Chicagoan. I know. Born in Beirut, Lebanon, Dr. Shakur earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry with distinction in 90, 1993 and a Medical Diploma in 1997 from the American University of Beirut. From 1997 to 2000, he completed his family medicine residency at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. In 2009, he earned a master's degree in healthcare management from the University of Texas at Dallas. So, welcome. So, so I think we, it would be helpful to start out giving, having you just briefly tell us what's your interest, what motivates you to be interested in school-based healthcare, and to take the time to be here with us today. So, Mary, do you want to start? Sure. That's an easy one. Well, as, as. As it was just described, I, I am a nurse, and um, what um, Maureen didn't say about um, my background is that prior to coming to Nashville, I spent five years as a school nurse for the South Portland School Department. So I have a, a very, um, I have you in my heart as, uh, as we think about this, um, these issues. And um, so, and then, prof and then in my current job, I uh, have the opportunity to work on many grants that um, require states to look at their delivery system reforms and apply to, for assistance, because we're grant funded, and they apply for our assistance to help work on projects. And we almost always, in the projects that I work on, ask states to work on as teams, because you know met, these are problems that cannot be solved by Medicaid alone. We, we actually ask that they bring other partners to the table. And those are opportunities for all of you to get involved in some very interesting projects and to be part of the, the plan to solve some of the delivery system problems that we're having in our states and in our country. And so as states are working on um, medical home initiatives or on initiatives to improve the capacity of the safety net, there's a, an opening for you to be a part of that process. Now, we haven't seen a lot of school-based health centers as partners around the table. We have seen some. So I think there's a work ahead, and I'm hoping to see more of you as I go out to the states working on these projects. Great. Thanks, Mary. And Mark? Uh, I guess my involvement in, in school health really is a happy accident. Uh, I was 
Uh, you mentioned I was named deputy director last year, and due to retirements and promotions, we actually were uh, had two new deputy directors and had to decide how to divide the various bureaus and offices we have at our Medicaid agency here in New Mexico. And I said, well, I'll, I can do school health. I'll, I'll take that one. So that was kind of step one. Step two is when our school health manager uh, left to go to another agency, and, and suddenly they were reporting directly to me. Uh, and that's actually been a very good experience for me because instead of just relying on that manager to just handle things and if it's not broken that I don't have to worry about it. I've had to really get into the trenches and it's been an opportunity to work with a great bunch of people incredibly dedicated to the mission of school-based health centers and how they can contribute to the emerging healthcare environment and um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to get down there at the at a, at a deep level and, and find out you know, what this initiative is all about and, and how it can potentially help in the transformation of our healthcare delivery system here in New Mexico and nationally. Great, thank you. Dr. Shakur? Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's great to be here. Thank you all for uh, staying all the way till the last uh, <laughs> part of the conference before heading to the airport. Um, so I, I'm a family physician, and when I uh, finished my training and I, uh, in my previous job, I served as the medical director and executive director of Heartland International Health Center. Mm -hmm. This is a, uh, a federally qualified health center. It's a network of federally qualified health center of clinics on the north side of the city um, in Chicago. And when I started there, I was there for four years. One of the sites was a school-based health center at Sun High School. I know there are many of the Chicago folks here, so many of you would know about uh, Sun High School. And, and so I was a practicing physician there. I was able to see some patients there, some students at the, at the facility. Uh, but also I was at the same time the administrator from a clinical perspective, but I also served as the executive director. So so um, I, I had the oversight, the administrative oversight of that facility. And, and I believed so much in the, in the value and the mission of the work that happens at school health centers that by the end of my tenure there and four years later, we ended up having four school health centers up in Chicago on the north side. And it was, it was a, just a great experience to see um, not only how we provide services, but how we can make them sustainable, how we can create the right financial infrastructure to sustain those operations, but also provide the right top-notch clinical quality and not only primary care, but also have mental health services, oral health services. So I, I got the opportunity to kind of for four years to learn about school health centers and, and grow school health centers. And then when Mayor Daley appointed me to serve as the commissioner for the Chicago Department of Public Health, I took all those skills with me to that role. And uh, you know, the Chicago Public School is the third largest public school in the country with over 404,000 students in our systems every day. So it was really an important opportunity for me to kind of leverage the experience that I've had at Heartland International Health Centers and see from a public health perspective how we can create better um, integration uh, for services for students. That's great. We'll be anxious to hear how you're seeing that fits into your Healthy Chicago plans. Sure. Great. So I'm going to ask a few questions here, and um, I think probably starting with Mary um, would be, what's your vision for successful implementation of school-based health centers in healthcare reform? And what, what do you think their rightful place is in a reform environment? Um, well, healthcare reform, if we're, if we're talking about the Affordable Care Act, which is what we've been all talking about. We, the Affordable Care Act has been mostly about the individual mandate and somewhat less about the Medicaid expansion and hardly at all about the delivery system kinds of changes that are part of the Affordable Care Act. But it's the delivery system changes where I really see new opportunities for for school-based health centers to be a part of the changes that need to happen in our country. As, as many of you know, our delivery system is quite broken, and, and I think that's something both sides of the aisle can, can embrace, that uh, you know, the U.S. Is, is last in quality and highest in cost when you look at industrialized nations. And if you look a little further at why we are that, it's because we rank near the bottom on the way we deliver primary care. There is a role for school-based health centers to be a part of that delivery system reform. One school-based health center, one prime, 
primary care physician office, one specialist, one hospital, one of those practices alone cannot be part of that change. But together, they can reach the goals that we need for healthcare reform. It really requires partnerships across the entire healthcare system in order for us to reach the kinds of goals that we want around the triple aim. How do we improve the patient experience? How do we improve patient outcomes? How, how do we reduce costs? And by developing better relationships, which I think what I've been hearing about um, the, the past day is, is really how we can, you can, be a part of that change, be making sure that um, we are having at least better conversations with the providers in our community, whether it's a shared electronic medical record, whether it's actually contractual relationships saying that I will share my information with you. I, I will let you know when my, your kids are in my emergency room department. I will, I will work with you to help reach those triple aim goals we can't do that alone, and I think the payment systems that we are seeing that are now being driven at the states, the, the medical homes payment, the affordable uh, or accountable care organization payments, global payments, those really require that we have relationships across the system, and a primary care, a, a pediatrician's office is not gonna be able to do it without part, some kind of partnership with their school-based health clinic. Uh, a hospital is not gonna be able to reduce their readmission rate unless they're working better and giving data to their school-based health centers and, and other people in the community. So there, there is tremendous opportunity out there. It's really quite exciting to see um, new roles for, for um, folks like you in, in, in this room and new roles for um, other providers across the country. Great, thank you. I'm gonna shift to um, prevention to Dr. Chakir. So with all the talk about prevention and early intervention in the debate, healthcare debate, there doesn't seem to be much focus on primary prevention in school-aged children, um, in early implementation at least. Do you have a perspective on why that is and where you see that uh, coming in the reform? Sure, I, I, I think I've uh, always been more of a positive person and I see the, you know, the glass half full rather than uh, half empty. And, and I'm not sure I agree that there is actually lack of focus on um, uh, primary prevention and school health uh, services. I think, you know, and Mary mentioned, a lot of us when we looked and, and when we started hearing about the Affordable Care Act, we mostly heard about insurance coverage and what are we gonna do about making sure that people who don't have insurance have access to insurance. But if you look at the Affordable Care Act, I think in my mind the most important aspects of the Affordable Care Act is really around the delivery system redesign and this is core if we're gonna be serious about transforming the health of our, our communities and, and, and our country. And the, the other element that I saw was extremely important in the Affordable Care Act. It started to kind of get rid of that dichotomy between public health and clinical services. Mm -hmm. A lot of time, and I, I'm guilty as everybody else, when I was in the, in the school-based health center field work, I was mostly focusing on the clinical services. But what we've seen in the Affordable Care Act is that shift to help us think more of healthcare as a continuum that starts all the way in public health and ends in, in clinical services. So a couple of things I wanted to highlight within the, the Affordable Care Act that I think are very critical uh, for primary prevention and for a focus on school health um, services from a public health perspective is the creation of the Public Health and Prevention Fund um, and, and, and the, in the Affordable Care Act. So this is a $15 billion investment over the next 10 years that would really allow us to focus on primary prevention and focus on creating the right systems, the right policies, and the right environment so that our kids grow healthy. Um, those $15 billion, we've already seen an investment of over 1.25 million uh, billions that are already coming into our communities to work on all kind of different things from, you know, policies within the schools, healthy eatings in schools, physical activities, recess policies, um, smoking policies, and others. And so those funds that are already coming into our communities, we're starting to see an impact on those. And I'll be happy to talk a little bit later about specific examples of how we're using these funds in Chicago to make 
make a difference uh, in primary prevention and specifically in school health. Um, the other example also on, um, on primary prevention or on the public health side is the home visitation programs. Again, you know, over $200 million were invested, um, I think, this year um, into home visitation programs through different states, and we're hoping that that investment for very, very early childhood will allow us to get healthier kids going into, school health, into schools um, and hopefully better graduation rates, better education attainment, and healthier communities. Um, and then if we continue on that continuum and we think about the clinical services, we've also seen a lot of investment that's already paying off. Um, many of you here, and I, I don't need to speak um, a lot of details about the uh, funds that are going directly to school-based health centers. I know in Chicago, many of our school-based health centers were able to benefit from um, some additional funding, whether it's for infrastructure or facilities or even expanding services. And I think that initial round of investment is going to expand access to services to almost 440,000 students throughout the country. Again, significant investment into the clinical aspect of of that um, of that service, and then obviously the other partner, the other partner that's significant in helping us move um, and improve access to primary care services are federally qualified health centers. So I trained in a federally qualified health centers. I saw patients in a federally qualified health centers. I ran federally qualified health centers. So again, there was a significant investment into federally qualified health centers to expand services and that partnership between federally qualified health centers and school-based health centers, I mean, we're seeing it across the country that's being growing and, and it's being solidified. So I think on the, on the clinical sides, on the public health side, I think I'm seeing a lot more, um, um, a lot more focus on primary prevention and on, um, and on um, 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 specific needs of school, uh, school, uh, school students. The, the other piece that we'd wanna be, obviously we're all very interested in is what's gonna happen tomorrow uh, with the Supreme Court and, and the decision that will be coming mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. Mark, Mark? One thing I'd like to mention, because we, we talk about the individual mandate and potentially adding folks with insurance, uh, and then there's also the Medicaid expansion component. But one thing to keep in mind, if there's not a, a caregiver for that individual to see, that insurance isn't worth you know, very much. And so one of the things that we're focused on here in New Mexico is the whole access to care issue, which I think the school-based health centers can play an important role in. Uh, because uh, if, if you're reducing the, uh, the number of the uninsured, but you don't want to basically be driving them to emergency departments because there's not a primary care physician for them to see, then you're just creating additional problems for yourself. And particularly for a state like New Mexico, where upwards of 40% of our population lives in frontier areas. I mean, not rural, you know, that would be a promotion. It's, uh, you know, it's frontier areas and, and access to care is, uh, is paramount. Uh, if any of y'all were able to make the trip to Santa Fe, you may have seen a billboard. You know, New Mexico needs doctors, nurses, uh, and dentists. Uh, and, and we really do, by the way, so if you'd like to stay, you're welcome to, uh, but, but that becomes extremely important, is not only, you know, delivering the promise of insurance, but, you know, the, the promise of care that goes with that, and how do you deliver that uh, when you're bringing potentially many more people into the system who right now aren't getting any primary care because they're only basically going, you know, to hospitals for acute care when something really you know, drastic has gone on. And I think school-based health centers, because they're in the community, uh, be um, become, I think, a very critical part of that delivery system. Great. Can I just add sure. on to that? Um, I totally agree with you. What, some of the, it, it's interesting to see the shift in state thinking and some of the projects they, they look to get our help on. And um, we have a project right now that's supported by HRSA, and this is exactly what um, states are looking for assistance in. They're, scared about the Medicaid expansion, where these people, where the new and um, covered people are going to get their primary care. And they are now looking for assistance on how to help some of the providers that are um, not traditionally looked at. And these are people other than FQHCs. These are their school-based health centers. They are HIV clinics. They're free clinics. They're looking for assistance in helping to prepare those providers to expand their capacity and to be able to bill and take these patients and be their primary care provider. So, you know, if the Medicaid expansion happens, to, you know, tomorrow, which 
We're, there's, there's quite a few of the experts would say that the Medicaid expansion will stay. We'll see. But if the Medicaid expansion does um, ex uh, happen, then there is, there is some really uh, good conversation that will happen, um, I think, that will ensue, and that the, the doors at Medicaid will be open, and um, the, that you'll have some opportunities to take a, a, a greater role in those, that delivery system. Great. And, you know, um, we're, We'll get to your other questions <laughs> soon, but I mean, obviously, this is a, a critical topic because yeah. who is the expansion? I mean, you know, in Medicaid, we're covering the kids now, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part. So, you know, we're really looking at adults. Many of them are young adults. Uh, there may be people, you know, the ACA enabled uh, kids to stay on their parents' policies longer, but that assumes that their parents have got some insurance, which they may not. Uh, so, one of the things I think from an SVHC standpoint to think about and some, you know, some of those centers in New Mexico are thinking about this is, you know, serving the kids during the day and potentially serving, you know, the adult population, you know, in the evening and providing a, another point of service there. Uh, because when you think about the Medicaid expansion, I think it's important to keep in mind who are these folks and, and they're going to be uh, adults. Uh, they're going to be many of them, maybe the working poor. Uh, maybe young adults, maybe you know, maybe adults who graduated from the very high school that your school-based health center is in. And so, when you look at continuity of care and building relationships, uh, potentially, you know, having an anchor, you know, in the community like an SBHC, where you know the kids were getting care there when they were 15, and then maybe they're getting care there when they're 27 after hours. I mean, that, we'll see how all this emerges, but that's certainly something we're interested here, you know, in New Mexico is potentially. Uh, moving school-based health centers, uh, you know, after hours into serving some of these other uh, people who are going to be eligible for Medicaid, assuming that the Medicaid ex uh, expansion is upheld. Right. So, Mark, I'm going to follow up and ask you so from the state um, leadership perspective. You know, would, do you have any advice for the school-based health centers to get the attention of the state health policy folks who have not embraced the Accountable sure. Care Act and reform? I think part of it is just telling your story. I mean, you have to know the numbers, obviously. Uh, you know, one of the numbers that we talk about here in New Mexico is, you know, 50,000 students uh, with access to health care via school-based health centers, which for some of your larger states, you're thinking that's a drop in the bucket, but that's a significant uh, percentage of our population here uh, in, in New Mexico. Uh, but then there's also the anecdotal, uh, you know, uh, information that you all have. You know, the kids who say, you know, you're the reason I graduated from high school. Um, what happened in New Mexico, interestingly, this was several years ago, uh, our then governor visited a school-based health center, and at that time I think we had about 25 school-based health centers participating in Medicaid, and, you know, the governor is there listening to kids talk about their stories, and our secretary of our department is there, and the governor basically turns to her and says, I want more of these. And, you know, we've doubled since then the number of school-based health centers. So I think it's a powerful story to tell. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of times uh, we talk about health outcomes, but with school-based health centers, the, the outcomes go beyond health. You know, they go beyond that. They go staying in school. Um, you know, mental health, uh, reduction of, of suicide, uh, because the school-based health center really, in my mind, by definition, you know, integrates the mind and the body. When I was looking at a, an intake questionnaire at one of our SBHCs here in New Mexico last week, and it's comprehensive, you know, there's the physical stuff, but there's the mental stuff, there's, it's, it's, and it's really what we, I would want for primary care. You're not separating, you know, the body from the mind and, oh, you're, you're depressed, so I need to send you over there. No, it's all happening right there, and it's happening in school where you can conveniently deliver, you know, that care. Uh, I think that's a powerful story to tell. Uh, I mean, what legislator, you know, in his or her right mind would, would say, well, no, I, I'm not interested in something that will keep kids in school. You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm for a higher dropout rate. Well, no, it's, a, it's absurd. <laughs> But what you have to do is you have to make the connection between delivering services there in a school where it's convenient for kids and where they're going to do it. You know, whereas there, you know, you make them a referral somewhere else. Are they going to go there or not? You know, probably not, to be honest. So I think um, there are real benefits, not just for the individual 
student, but for society as a whole. And it's a matter of getting that message out and getting, you know, getting your local legislature to visit your school-based health center. Because when they talk to these kids, they're going to hear a powerful impact. That, that these are having you know, in their lives, and you start building allies that way. And it certainly worked that way here in New Mexico. Great, thank you. So Mary, um, we had a session, a fairly well-attended session this morning about the primary care medical home. And so since that's an area of expertise that you have, um, could you talk about the risks and rewards of school-based health centers becoming primary care medical homes? And, and what if they're not? You know, what do you think the consequences might be or some alternative ways to approach it? Sure, I'll start with the risk. Uh, the risks are that it's going to make your hair turn gray. You're going to be up all night. It's, your life is going to be hell for a while of this idea of becoming a medical home, a medical home that's qualified. Because, you know, let's face it, it people say, oh, I'm a medical home. Oh, oh yeah, I've been a medical home for 30 years. I've been doing this for quite some time. But now we have some standards and some tools that actually help payers, Medicaid, commercial payers, Medicare, recognize who is a medical home. Now, they may not be the best tools out there. I, I'm, I'm not, a, not saying that one tool is better than the other or that this is the way to go, but this is what is happening, that to become a medical home from a payer point of view, at least in 20 states, they're using NCQA or some kind of state-based standard saying that you are a medical home. Now, um, the other risk is, as I, as, I, as I mentioned, this is really hard, but it's also hard for that solo pediatric practice. So you put yourself in their shoes. If, if it's just a pediatrician and, and their front end staff, they have less resources than you do to become a medical home. It's, it's hard work to become a medical home. but. The reward is that by becoming a medical home, by starting to align what you're doing now, it's going to be validation. It's going to be the respect that you want as providers to say, yeah, I can meet those NCQA standards. Did you? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't. Now, you can, if you haven't looked at the NCQA standards, you really should. If, or you should be looking at some standards. You know, if, if you live in one of the six states that develop their own standards, take a look at that and start working now. Take a look, do it one at a time. It takes a while, it takes a long time to transform, and you may not have all the resources to do it, but you do have the resources to start shaping your practice to become one of these medical homes, and you're gonna have a better practice for it you, you might be surprised that when you start measuring patient experience and satisfaction, maybe all your patients aren't so satisfied and maybe you could be doing something a little better. You know, it, it might be very eliminating part of the, your quality improvement process, but you should be doing that. You should be thinking about after hours care. This is, you heard, this is, this is where it's at. This is, this is what Medicaid needs. This is what other payers, um, need, you should be thinking about weekend care. What, what, what could that model look like? But you should be doing this. Now, if NCQA in the end says, no, I'm sorry, you're a school-based health center, I, we don't recognize school-based health centers, which is basically what they're saying, there are workarounds. That states are working around NCQA. Missouri is, is, is telling their community mental health centers, become NCQA certified, but send the paperwork to us. Send it to the state. We'll look at it and we'll call you NCQA and we'll send you an extra payment. There's a way to work around all these things and states are finding ways that they change from one state to another. So I would say start down the road, start down the road now. Um, some, you know, you can take a, an assessment, you can, you, there's some very quick downloads, um, you know, that are, you know, particularly for pediatric practices that are transfer med. There's, there's all sorts of tools that you can do, a gap analysis of what you need to do to become a medical home. But the reward will be there as far as maybe a payment that supports your operations. And I think the respect thing is, is pretty, something that would feel really good to have. But the, really the reward is that you're gonna be given better patient care and that's what really what we want in the end. Mm -hmm. And what if a, a, a center opts not to or can't become a medical home? Where do you see them fitting into the? Well, it's, 
as you start to develop uh, or you, as you start to look at the, the standards, you, you're going to see some that you really can't do alone. I mean, you're going to need to partner. You're going to need to partner with that FQHC down the road. You may need to partner with your pediatric provider down the road and, and, and work on some after-hours stuff. It's going to require some partnerships that I think in the end is a good thing. So Dr. Chakur, tell us about Healthy Chicago and how you see the school-based health centers fitting into the plans that you have in Chicago and from the public health perspective. Sure. So, you know, back in August of 2011, Mayor Emanuel and I released our, our Healthy Chicago agenda, which is our public health agenda for the city. And what we've done in that agenda, we've identified 12 public health priorities. We've set measurable targets for each one of those priorities that we'd want to achieve by 2016 and 2020. And then we've identified very specific strategies around policy systems, environmental change, but also programmatic interventions and health education campaigns to help us reach those targets. And the priorities are no surprise to anybody. We're talking about tobacco, we're talking about obesity, about HIV prevention, but we were very strategic in making sure that adolescent health is one of those uh, priorities that we've identified. So I, I um, you know, the, the public health agenda is available online at cityofchicago.org slash health or for some of the folks who are on Twitter and I'm following them here as we um, as we're sitting, um, you can find us on Shy Public Health. But what we've done in that agenda, we've clearly identified adolescent health as one of our priorities. We've set the targets that we'd want to achieve. We've identified the policies, the programs, and the education campaigns that we'd want to implement to help us do that. And when we were developing this, we've looked at school-based health centers really as our core public health intervention. I mean, you know, a lot of folks think of the school health centers as a clinical site. In my mind, they're a lot more than clinical sites. They really are our public health interventions in the schools. So some of the specific examples, and I'll, I'm going to list some of them, and during the q and I'll be happy to comment on a little bit more. Um, you know, one specific interventions we're doing is around uh, STI screening. So we have an expanded sexually transmitted infection uh, screening programs throughout the city where we're in 30 high schools in the neighborhoods that have the highest rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia, and we're able to screen almost 10,000 students in those high schools. And, and, you know, the positivity rate, this is our fourth year, and we're starting to see a decline um, in those rates. You know, my favorite example is one specific high school where we partnered with a school health center. In the first year, the positivity rate was at 16%. In the second year, we went back, and this is one of our largest high schools, the positivity rate went down to 9%. And it's that working relationship between the health department and the school-based health center that really made a difference in that school. Now, 9% is still high. Those are, you know, kind of screening, so it, it's great to see that, um, that decline. Another example is around our, uh, our oral health uh, screening programs. You know, we partnered with uh, almost 400 schools throughout the city, and we do oral health screenings, and and the school health centers that have um, that have um, uh, oral programs, it's a lot easier to refer those students to get services. Again, over 112,000 students were screened, and we were able to refer a good number of those to oral health uh, programs within uh, school-based health centers. And I can tell you tons of examples. We have teen dating violence program that's, again, hand-in-hand -hand between the public health department, the school, and the school-based health centers. Um, Anti-bullying programs, violence prevention programs, uh, but also around uh, um, also around uh, teen pregnancy prevention programs, uh, we were able to receive almost $20 million grant over the next five years to work on lowering teen, um, teen pregnancy um, in, in Chicago, and we're working with many of the school health centers. One of actually our um, 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 uh, pioneer school health centers is our, at our Simpson um, High School, where I think um, I saw Maryland here from uh, Rush University, the school, uh, the school of Nursing program that provides really targeted, excellent services to pregnant teenage girls and make sure that they are graduating from high school. So a lot of these examples, and I'll be happy to comment on them a little bit more if there are questions okay. specific to those. I think my message is that for every school-based health center here, if you don't know who your local health department official is, 
you want to make sure to go and knock at their door and ask them specifically, what is their adolescent health strategy? Where is your adolescent and school health office? We created a very specific office within the health department that's targeted only and only on school health and adolescent health. So I would encourage you to contact your local health officials and ask them specifically about their, uh, their school health strategies. Great. Thank you. Um, well, Mark, <laughs> the dreaded question. I'm gonna, we just, I, and I know you have a brief answer to this. This was one of the questions that we kind of fought over about payment trends. And, and sure. um, I know you don't have a crystal ball on this, but yeah. if you could give us at least a, sure. a state perspective on. Well, I think the global issue is that payers, and not just Medicaid, I think any, any payers, are, are really wanting to be out of the business of paying for services. You know, the more I, services I deliver, the more money I'm getting. That's, that's really not a model that, um, that people are interested in anymore. You hear people talking about paying for outcomes, um, and, and that's really what we want. I mean, one of the things, we have an initiative in New Mexico we're working on called Centennial Care, uh, which is intended to really uh, transform, that may be overstating it, but certainly significantly change how we deliver uh, care in the Medicaid program here in New Mexico. And uh, one of the things we talk about is, you know, delivering the right care in the right setting at the right time. And uh, I think too often the incentives that are built into our system today are, are focused on, on more is better. And no one can afford that anymore. Uh, it's, just, it's just become not sustainable. And that's one of the things about our, our Centennial Care Initiative. It's really independent of health care reform. Yes, uh, one of the drivers was the idea that we may have an 175,000 new eligibles coming on board in 2014. But even without that, we felt like that the program as it exists today just is not you know, sustainable. And you know, the idea that more is better is, uh, is really passe. And that's why you're getting into things like health homes and, uh, and medical homes and accountable care organizations, you know, with the accountability for, you know, I'm not interested in paying you just to do an MRI. I really want this patient to be healthier. And I want that patient to, you know, miss less work or miss less school, uh, those, those kinds of outcomes. Uh, so I think as a school-based health center, you know, A, you need to understand your costs. And I realize that for, for a lot of school-based health centers, probably all of them, you know, it's a patchwork of reimbursement that you're dealing with. You've got a little Medicaid over here. You, you're going after grants where you can. Um, you know, in some cases, you may be able to bill a parent's insurance company, but you're trying to piece all that together. But I think in, as we move into all of these new different, these different models, uh, I think understanding your cost structure, where's the money going, what money's coming in, can at least be a first step so that you can try to start responding to these uh, these sorts of initiatives. Great. Thank you. So we're going to turn to the audience now, and um, I think that um, we have people with microphones. So if you have a question, or could you come up to the microphone, and could you identify yourself and where you're from? Um, and if, if you have a specific uh, panel member to ask the question to, otherwise we'll figure out how to <laughs> spread it out. We can't see very well with these lights. <laughs> going to need your help. Yeah, shy, group. shy. I'm tired. <laughs> well, let, let me, um, Mark, let me follow up with that question. Is, oh, we have some. Okay, great. Thank you. You're the brave soul uh, here. Yeah, I thought well, no one else is going. May I have just a quick comment? Yes, okay. please. So I'm really happy that you're all here. It's wonderful to hear from you. I'm Satu Larson. I'm coming from UC San Francisco. And I just had a quick caution about NCQA. Um, you know, school-based health centers are amazing, and they fit a totally different model. And I am concerned that NCQA survey tool may not capture the full essence of what a school-based health center does. So although I really am happy to hear that we're talking about trying to become credited as patient-centered medical homes, I worry that if we try and play by the physician model that was set out, um, we're not going to gain the respect that we already have because we already include 
the medical, the mental, the nursing, the social work, the education, the community, the health educator, all of that into one. And we're already a medical home and a medical neighborhood. So um, I know we need to play the game and NCQA may be the way to go, but I'm not sure that that's the model that we really want to embrace. And I don't have a solution yet for that, but hopefully we'll get one soon that will really capture the essence of how school-based health centers are an amazing model of care. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would love to respond to that. First, uh, a disclaimer, I do not work for NCQA, and um, <laughs> I have, um, I, I'm just reporting the facts, um, and the facts are that um, payment is tied to NCQA recognition. And if you want to be paid um, by payers that uh, are tying a payment to NCQA payment, you need to look at NCQA. Now, um, I, I will also tell you that, um, you know, this is part of what we hear. We hear this from primary care providers, uh, primary care physicians. Oh, I don't need NCQA. I, I am just what you just decide, just what you described to me. I, I do all those things. I don't need to be recognized. And you know, and, and part of it is a is a paperwork thing. You know, it is a big hassle, and, and maybe it'll be really easy for some health centers to um, to show that they have the capacity to be a recognized medical home. But uh, I, I would challenge you again to take a look now, because they're talking about um, continuity of care. They're talking about access, access beyond the nine to five or the eight to three or whatever hours that you might have. They're, they're talking about how you measure and how are you measuring? Are you measuring patient satisfaction? Because it's probably a good idea to do it. Are you measuring, how are you measuring on your quality outcomes and how do you rate to other health centers, to other pediatric practices? That's part of the quality improvement process. Now, maybe you feel like you don't have to do that, and maybe, maybe you do that. But I will tell you that if you have that data to show what your ED rates are, look like for your kid population, and you're able to show your ED rates um, to the payer, to the commercial payer, to Medicaid, to whoever, against um, the pediatric um, practice down the road, and say, well, my rates are better. Look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a great job with follow-up, and I can keep the kids out of the ER. You've got, you've got their attention. You, this is, the, this is the hard, that's the hard work, the measuring what you do. And it's, it needs to be done. It's how payment is going to be you know, provided. You're going to be paid on your performance. And that's what they're looking at for performance, ED rates, hospital readmission rates. Do you have that data? You, you need to get it, and and I don't know how you get it. There's that's I, I don't have an easy answer there. Maybe it's that art grant that's laying on the table. You know, you start to look at this stuff, um, but it it's it's it, it's something to be looked at. Thanks. Yes, we have another question. Uh, the New Mexico Alliance of School-Based Healthcare, and one of them there, Frontier Towns, in New Mexico, and I'd kind of like to second what. Uh, the sister over here said, but going with what you said, I think if I'm looking at it right, she's looking at why do we have to follow the old model? And you as a school nurse and having been a school nurse, and I hear it from all of you, I'm very refreshed to hear, we are also public health as well as primary care. We're a continuum of care. So can we look at medical homes without saying, well, we have to expand our hours if we can. We did in Des Moines, New Mexico, a wellness clinic because we were so underserved and did what you were talking about to serve the parents, which then enhanced uh, student participation. But couldn't we partner with home visiting nurses, with emergency rooms, with primary care to look at a new model and we are still the medical home? because a me medical home is patient-centered care, mind, body, and spirit. So I'd like to say let's not copy the medical model again, which I think sometimes we gravitate to when we're more of a public health nursing 
conceptual mind-body-spirit model. And I think that's sort of what the sister was saying. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alette Hershon, and I'm from New York State, uh, Westchester County. I have um, one question and one comment. Um, God, I didn't realize how short I was. <laughs> um, okay, um, I guess I'll start with um, my comments about um, NCQA Medical Home. Um, my um, FQHC is a medical home, and we did not elect at the last go around to apply for medical home status. We wanted to get our, our four federally qualified homes, our centers um, certified. We are up for recertification now, and we are already working on our applications, and we are planning on applying for our schools. We do measure quality, and we're very proud of what we do in our federally qualified health centers and in our school-based health centers. We feed back that quality to our providers in our school-based health centers, and um, we, we're not embarrassed of our outcomes, and it's a way to improve care. So I agree with you. Okay, so that's the first thing on um, medical home. Um, my question is, um, which we find very frustrating in New York City, in New York State, is how do we get, how do school-based health centers get into the conversation of healthcare reform? Um, we are, even our Department of Health is kind of perplexed with that. Um, it's always about primary care, but how do school-based health centers specifically get to that table where the, where the decision makers are? So I, guess, I guess that's my question. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy to give you my perspective on how you could get at the table at a local level. Obviously, I, probably Mark will give more on a, a state level. But, but I think that it really starts with your local health department. I think, uh, I think Divya is here from the Illinois Maternal and Child Health Coalition. Is she here? Uh, probably she left. The, the, the Illinois and Children, um, um, Child and, uh, Maternal and Child Health Coalition in, in Chicago is very, very active in engaging the local health department. So when we were developing our strategy on a local level, they were sitting right there at the table. They were the content expert on reviewing our adolescent health strategies. And when we released that, they were our partner in releasing that. And, and you know, when we're talking about local level, we do get local funding, but most of our funding comes from the federal government. So, so the way we're investing our resources at a local level when it comes to adolescent health is very, very tied in with input and with active participation from school-based health centers in Chicago. So I really encourage you to contact your local health uh, official and see how they're investing their resources. I mean, in Chicago, our department invests over $200 million every year into the public health system, and most of this money comes from the federal government, and, and a good chunk of that money is coming because of the Affordable Care Act. So you have to be engaged at a local level, and if you do know those folks, you know their email address, you know their, their phone numbers, you know their Twitter accounts, you comment on their Facebook pages, I think that will create that visibility that you would need at a local level. And as I mentioned earlier, from a state level, um, I think there's probably people who just don't even understand that school-based health centers exist. And, and making sure that they know that they exist and the role that they play, the number of students that you see, you know, from a state perspective, Medicaid is a huge budget driver. I mean, you know, you talk about education and prisons and Medicaid, and that's where most of the dollars are going. And so when, in, in terms of health care reform from a state, uh, you know, government level at least, Medicaid is, is the big driver. And the idea of this influx of hundreds of thousands of people coming on board and, and letting your legislators know, you know, there's a delivery model out there that is basically what people are talking about. You know, in, I won't get into the whole NCQA thing, but in terms of what y'all are trying to do and your ability to do it, to render integrated care at, at a setting where people actually have got access and then getting good outcomes, I think you have a wonderful story to tell, but you have to tell it. Uh, and that could be on an individual basis, uh, with your local legislator, if you've got a state association, you know, working together to how do we get the attention of lawmakers so that they know that this program even exists? Because I totally believe once you once you know about it, you know, once you've visited a health center, you're going to be a fan. 
I mean, but it's just a matter of making that happen. I do want to um, second that kind of from a personal uh, from a personal experience and I I remember when I uh, was a very very young executive director of a community health center that ran a school-based health center my first interactions with my congresswoman at the time was inviting her to the school-based health center at Sun High School and we've since then developed this wonderful relationship and many of you here might know congresswoman Jan Schakowsky who was very critical in advancing the Affordable Care Act, who's a great supporter and great advocate of school-based health centers. And because of that very initial invite to Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, my relationship with her right now is a, is a wonderful relationship that we could have those conversations back and forth on, on a policy level, even at a federal level. That's great. Yes. Hi. Um, first, I'd, I'd like to thank you for, um, for the, alliance, the National Alliance to have this opportunity for this um, dialogue. I'm Paula Lisser. I'm the uh, manager uh, in New Mexico for the School-Based Health Center Improvement Cho Project, which is funded by CMS, one of the uh, CHIPRA grants, and we're partnering with Colorado. And we are actually testing, in the process of testing, how 10 of our school-based health centers here in New Mexico are going to become person-centered medical homes. And what is driving it is the sponsorship of each school-based health center. So four of our school-based health centers are sponsored by FQHCs. They're going with NCQA. So we are already this past year have um, started that assessment process. Uh, Two of the school-based health centers have already, well, one has already submitted their application uh, September, will submit it September 15th. We've already done the preliminary assessment for those four, and they all are at least a level two or already almost a level three. And that's just doing the assessment. So I have a feeling just from that experience that if you really look at the assessment tool and you really start studying what is out there besides NCQA, I think you'll be surprised how far along you already are. Now in New Mexico, we have um, a patchwork of sponsorship. So we have two other uh, school-based health centers that we'll be working with to become uh, youth, as we would like to say, youth-centered medical homes. Um, and they are sponsored by universities. Another one is sponsored by a foundation. So we've got our work cut out for us, but we're in the process of testing this. Our grant ends in 20, February 2015, so we hope we will be back with uh, the next um, National Alliance meeting and report our findings. And again, I think it, it just, uh, I, you really have to, the other thing we've learned in this um, grant is that you really have to cement your partnerships uh, with your state Medicaid office, with your Department of Health, your local public health offices, um, your universities, everyone that, you know, the, the education, the public education department, everyone really needs to become aware of our mission and how that we are a bona fide healthcare delivery system. So I, again, I, I thank you and, and look for our um, reports that will be, well, we'll be coming to the convention every year. So <laughs> we'll, we will just have to tell you our story as we go along. Thank you. Great. Great. John Schlitt, School-Based Health Alliance. I wonder to all the panelists, the safety net, at least as the federal government defines it, has been afforded uh, a rather um, enhanced payment mechanism that, as I hear payment reform happening, potentially could go away. What is your view of how the safety net will continue to be paid when we're not paying for fee standard fee-for-service volume, 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 but value? Is that going to change? Are our safety net providers going to see a different pay payment mechanism? Is prospective payment system going the way of the dinosaurs? 
Mark, you want that one? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but I'll. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, truth in advertising, no one really knows what's going to be happening over the next few years. I mean, to me, you know, the Affordable Care Act isn't the end, it's the start. Uh, and so I think there's going to be a lot of, of different, you know, payment initiatives. I mean, from, I think from a safety net standpoint, certainly speaking as a, as a Medicaid official, what we don't want is the emergency departments to be the primary care delivery system for our population. And that's really often what it becomes. And so you don't have continuity of care. Uh, that kind of gets back to what I said earlier about the right care at the right time in the right setting. Um, so um, I, I think it really is going to behoove all of us just to be on our toes, you know, frankly, and to be at the table. And that's where it becomes that much more important to let people know who you are and what role you play. and. Uh, the fact that you know you've got basically ac access to the patients right there in your same campus, you know they're they're already there, so the access isn't an issue, and you perform a, a critical role in uh, in providing both the physical and behavioral health needs that these students have, you know keeping them in school. In terms of some of the different payment initiatives that are going to be going on, a lot of them are going to be experiments and. Uh, and being willing to potentially participate in, in those sorts of things. I think depending on how your state's Medicaid program is structured, you know, how much of it is fee-for-service versus how much of it is managed care. New Mexico's heavily managed care, 80 percent, and we'd like to get close to 100 percent, which means relationships with the managed care organizations become very important. And, um, you know, for, you know and, and, and it not being a voluntary basis whether they're going to contract you, but basically telling you know, from our perspective, the managed care organizations, and you are going to contract with the school-based health centers, that this is fundamental to our delivery system here in New Mexico. Getting to that level in your states where it's considered integral and not just, oh, yeah, and we have school-based health centers, but rather, no, this is actually a core part of our delivery system to a significant segment of our population. Uh, you know, what the, the, the specifics are of this payment methodology versus that one, uh, there's going to be all sorts of things that are going to be tried over the years, but I think the bottom line is access to care becomes critical. That's, to me, fundamental, you know, more fundamental than actually how you figure out how to pay for it. And the fact that y'all are there uh, providing this care, providing this access, and then making sure that leadership knows that you're there and that you have a place at the table. I mean, from a reimbursement perspective, that's kind of a vague answer, but I honestly don't know what's going to be happening. People, you know, people wish for things. You know, I wish we lived in a world where we're just paying for outcomes, but what does that really look like? The reality is this is the start of a long process, and it'll be interesting to sit here, you know, five years from now and see what our environment really looks like. You know, assuming that ACA goes forward you know, intact, you know, what does our delivery system look like five years from now? Because it's, it's just going to be interesting to see how we get there. And there'll be things that'll work and there'll be things that, that don't work. But I think given your population, the population that the school-based health centers serve, um, y'all are going to be part of that. Uh, but just make sure you hold up your hand and, and let everyone know that you're there. Can I add to that? Sure. Just quickly, we're, this is a, a really big topic in Medicaid, how the prospective payment system took payment for um, the FQHCs. Um, and uh, we're having, actually having a webinar on this on Friday. And I can tell you that uh, it's, it's, it's a subject of great interest. And, but the bottom line is that it's, the PPS rates are, Congress, it's, a con, it's an act of Congress and it's going to take Congress to go and change that and so nothing's happening nothing's going to happen anytime soon but there are conversations going on and there are some um, systems health uh, safety net systems that are ready to move away from that payment system they're the front runners and they want they want to try something that's not based on visits that can really help them manage their care a little better and they're they're ready to start to come out and experiment and I think that's where we are right now can 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 a global budget, can, a cap, can they work in a capitated risk-based environment and, and let the front runners see how they do and, and, and it help, let that help inform public policy down the road? I 
think we're down to our last few minutes. Um, and I want to make sure that the panelists give us our last piece of advice. Do you have a quick question? I just actually have a quick comment. Okay. I just wanted Great. to respond. My name is Yolanda Cordova, and I'm the director for the Office of School and Adolescent Health here in New Mexico. So, one, I just want to thank everyone for coming and visiting our beautiful state and our beautiful city, and I hope you had a wonderful time. Um, I just wanted to comment on what Mark said because I think uh, I got into the business of school-based health care just seven years ago. I was lucky enough to sort of fall into this job because of Jane McGrath, the captain of my ship, as I call her. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so here I am, and it was my first opportunity to be involved in this, what I think is just an incredible um, system of care. Um, I'd always worked in mental health and was always talking about systems of care. And so here we are stuck in this. But I think what the opportunity is with the Affordable Care Act is exactly what Mark said. It's an opportunity for us with school-based health centers to forge those relationships and those conversations that nobody else is ever having. You know, um, one of the things that New Mexico has done, I want to thank our alliance. Um, they actually, we put together in, in preparation for Centennial Care or response to Centennial Care, a document that's going to be shared with our managed care organizations describing to them exactly what we think a great response would be to the request for proposal that's going to come out and what we would think um, a great plan of attack would be on their part to include school-based health centers as part of their, um, of, of their array of services in this new piece. So I think, I think like, you know, what's always happened with the school-based health center movement is that we've always kind of been in the front sort of talking about different ways of doing it and always putting that forward. And so I think it is, I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity to do that. We have a meeting, as a matter of fact, with one of our managed care organizations on Friday, specifically to talk about that white paper that was put together about what we think uh, would be a great response for school-based health centers. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I want, I want us to take just a, a minute or two and if, uh, ask each of our panelists if you had one word of advice as we move into this reform environment for school-based health centers, what would it be? Um, and Dr. Chikor, you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to start. Um, I think to me the, the key message is that we need to kind of go beyond the dichotomy between public health and clinical services. And we need to start thinking, and, and as many of us have started, but we need to enhance that thinking that school-based health centers really are public health interventions in our communities and how we can create that continuum of services from public health all the way to clinical services to really improve the population health. It's beyond what we do in school-based health centers is way beyond that one-on-one -on -one interactions, that prescription that we write or that doctor's note that we, that we send out. It's really about transforming our communities. Those are community assets. They're community assets that would help us get into healthier communities, healthier societies, and also an economic engine. So with that perspective, um, I encourage everyone to know their local officials, to know their uh, local health department strategy around school health and adolescent health, and also, and equally as important, to be involved in school wellness initiatives, school wellness policies, um, all of these type of initiatives that are beyond just the one-on-one um, -on -one interactions within the school. It's a lot of energy, it's a very exciting times, and it's really also an exciting opportunity to be in school health centers at this point. Mark? I think I would just say to be aware that, you know, basically health care reform is underway, independent of the ACA. Um, I was teasing John, you know, earlier, you know, what if the Supreme Court overturns the whole thing the day before this panel discussion? But, you know, the conclusion we both reached is, you know, the system itself is, is changing now, and it has to change. So really independent of what the Supreme Court does, the, the current system is not sustainable change is coming and and be a part of that be a part of that i think you you play a role in whatever the healthcare system is going to end up looking like but if if for some reason you know tomorrow we learn that you know the whole law is gone oh okay business as usual no business as usual is not an option so i think some of the same conversations all these conversations are relevant independent of the affordable care act so so keep working you know at that and be a part of it and, uh, and just know that our healthcare system is going to be transformed over the next few years uh, one way or another. 
And so it's important to be engaged. It's important to be not tied to old models. It's important to you know, educate yourself, whether it's webinars, whether it's reading, whether it's being just engaged in what's going on around, so that you can be a player uh, as, as these changes come in the years ahead. Great. And Mary? Um, I would agree that if, if the Supreme Court completely overturns the Affordable Care Act, health delivery system reform will go on. It's been going on in states. It's long before the Affordable Care Act. It'll be going on with or without it tomorrow. It has to go on. This model that we have right now is, is just not working. My, I guess I had three pieces of advice, but I, if I had to narrow it down to one, I would tell you to measure what you do. And be, may, and maybe you all are doing that. I, I'm not exactly sure, but um, measure how you do as far as looking at the triple aim goals, how you're um, reducing cost, huge, huge part of the piece. How are you improving population health? How are you improving your patient experience? And, and measuring what you do will mean that you need to submit claims for, for what you do because payers take those claims to decide pay for performance payments. They, they look at claims-based data, not the best stuff out there, but that's what, um, is you, what they're doing. So measuring what you do is, um, is part of um, being able to um, submit claims. So that, that's a big part. I know that's a heavy lift for some um, school-based health centers. I want to just say one last thing. The, the know your landscape idea, you know, know your state, know what's going on in states that look like yours. Please come to our website, which is nashby.org. We have a nifty map that shows you. You can click on and see what's going on in your state. You can s click on to see what your state's doing about health care reform. It, become familiar with um, the landscape. Great. Thank you so much. This has been great. I appreciate it. We have um, well shared your wisdom, and it's wonderful to see the partnerships and, and the, the broad perspective and value that you place in school, uh, school-based health care. And thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Thanks. And thank our panelists, please. We'll give you guys a chance to step down. Okay. <laughs> Well, that was a powerful hour. <laughs> um, Dr. Shakir, I think the glass is half full. I think you've really inspired us today to feel optimistic about where all of this is headed. And I think we've been, it's also, it's also emboldening to be validated by people like Mark Pitcock and Dr. Shakir and Mary Takash to hear that they see value in the work that we do and they speak it so well and so eloquently and we didn't coach them so um, so uh, it, that's very gratifying to have that kind of validation from very important public health and health policy leaders so I'm gonna invite my colleagues to wrap this up Lauren Deidre who started this whole thing on Monday I'm gonna put a big bow on it so um, I wish you all a tremendous year and we'll we'll see you in Washington next year Well, it was great to welcome you, and now it's a little bittersweet to say goodbye. But before we do that, I want to share just a little bit of data. We had 750 registrants for the conference. That's great. And we had over 200 people at our party last night. So, woo! -hoo! Okay. And we also raised almost $6,000 at the business meeting. But it's not too late if you didn't fill out your uh, pledge. Take it home with you and send it in so we can make it more than $6,000. And again, I'm Deidre. And my voice is gone a little bit because we did party hardy last night. <laughs> so forgive me. Uh, don't forget to do your evaluation. We hope that you have had a very wonderful experience, a learning experience here. And now we need you to do this for us. Let's go online and do your evaluations. The more that are done, the more information we have, the better our conferences can be. We, are, we will do a raffle. We've, made, we've received a donation from, one, from our CVS sponsor of $50. So everyone that does their raffle will be entered into that um, when, once it's over. And you all know that it closes August 10th. So I'm going to say that once again. 
the evaluation online process closes August 10th. So please do it as soon as possible. No later than August 10th. I cannot get it extended. Okay? Next year's convention. We're going to be in the capital city of this great country that we live in. We're in Washington, D.C. It is June 23rd through the 26th. Let's put it in your iPad, your iPhone, your BlackBerry, whatever it is that you use. Put the, save the date now. And visit our website if you plan to put in an abstract. Those will be live in September. We keep it up for about six weeks. So we want you to start planning what you want to do and what you think we need to learn for next year. All righty? So I'm turning it back over to my, my co OK, we're going to close with the fun things of giveaways. So the scavenger hunt first. And you have to be present to win. So the first winner, Lillian Leon? Lillian Leon. She just left. They're really big prizes to have to ship them to people, so. Okay, Paula Lark. Paula Lark? Oh. <laughs> okay, next one. Marie Shoulders Williams. Come on down. Kathy Hopkins. Oh, wait a second. Can I take one more? If you. Okay. That's fine. And one more. Alyssa Estrada. Alyssa, are you here? Someone have her in their room? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, Marjorie Williams. Okay. And now I'm going to ask Buffy Saavedra from uh, United Healthcare Community Plan of New Mexico to come up and give the iPad. She is the Director of Compliance and Regulatory Affairs. Thank you. <laughs> wow, the lights are very bright. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for um, allowing us to actually be an exhibitor here at your event. And my fellow New Mexicans, I don't know about you, but um, Mark uh, Pickcock made me very proud um, to be a New Mexican today. I thought he presented very well. So um, I'm from Albuquerque, born and raised, and I'm very pleased to be able to do a drawing first um, on behalf of United Healthcare for our New Mexico based providers. We are going to draw a name to win an iPad. And then I'm going to do a second drawing because many of you attending the conference put your card in the bowl. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a Starbucks gift card, and I have two of those for $25. So uh, just a little um, information. We're focused on our New Mexico providers today because United Healthcare is going to be going forward um, in bidding on the Centennial Care Plan that we've all been speaking of. So. Um, I'd love to meet with anybody that has questions afterward as well, and hopefully Yolanda, I'm not sure where you're sitting, but we'd love to set up a meeting with you all also to hear about what your best response would be to the RFP. So with that said, I'll get on with this and do our drawing for the iPad. And do you want to draw the name? Sure. Okay. And then you can hand that to me. Yeah, we can do a drum roll, right? The whole. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And the winner is Angie Solis, and she's with HMS New Mexico. All right. Great. Congratulations, Angie. Yes. And then I'll have you draw two more names. Hi, Angie. Congratulations. Okay, and then we're going to draw two names from the non-New Mexico pool. Um, and I'm sorry, they're for Starbucks gift cards, and that now doesn't sound as fun as an iPad, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, so the first individual is Diane Petito, 
and she is from Hempstead, New York, with the Hempstead High Health Center. Excellent. And Diana, I have to tell you, I have them both in my car, which is just downstairs. And so if you just wait for me after, I will get that to you. <laughs> I set them and I didn't pick them up. And the next individual is Keith Osborne from Rogersville, Tennessee, and he's a mobile unit coordinator. Okay, I don't see Keith. Um, I can send it to him. Are you guys okay with that? Okay, awesome. Thank you again for your time and your work. Okay, now we're going to do posters. So the third place winner for the poster is Outcome Evaluation of Health Services Intervention for Public Health Impact, Evalu Evaluation of the School-Based Health Center Reproductive Health Project, Dana Ewer and Rebecca Fisher. Are you here? Are you here? No? Well, we will send this to them. Second place is the effect of altering the timing of specimen collection on STI screening and detection rates in the SBHC population, Glenda McLean. Glenda? Well, we'll send that to her as well. And she is here. Okay, come on down. Okay, get a picture. And why she's coming down and getting her picture with Deidre, uh, the first place winner is Telehealth Communication in a School-Based Health Center, the Process of Implementation, Tammy Bland and Nan Gaylord. Are you here? Okay, well, we'll send that to, to them. All right. Now we're going to do the last three drawings. The first is for $100 off registration for next year's conference. Madra Ginn Jones from AAP. Okay. Just stand and wait, okay? You want us to draw it again? Okay. They would like to donate this to someone else who works at a school based health center. So we're going to draw again. Thanks, Madra. Okay. Oops. Okay. Claudia Cor Corbin. Last year, this is. Just stay up here, okay? Yeah, she's won before. She's got good luck. I know. Now, this is for our um, $200 off of registration next year. Vanessa Adams from Berlin, Maryland. And then the grand prize is for $500 toward registration next year. Barbara Denevers from Ojo Caliente, New Mexico. That's it? Thank you, safe travels, and we'll see you next year.